So the cardiovascular system, again, has three components, the heart, the blood vessels, and then the blood running through them. We're talking about the heart today, but we, I need to give you at least an introduction to the blood vessels so that when we talk about where heart, the blood is coming uh, from and, and going to, we understand the difference between our types of blood vessels. So arteries are the blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. vessels that carry blood to the heart. Capillaries are these little guys where we have the exchange of nutrients and gases. We've got Capillaries in the lungs, where we drop off CO2 and pick up oxygen. And then we've got capillaries in all the tissue, where we drop off oxygen and pick up our uh, CO2. So our capillaries we call the exchange vessels. And we'll talk more about all of the types of vessels in the next chapter. We need to at least understand what arteries and veins are today so that we can talk about blood flow to and from the heart. So a lot of people think that arteries <coughs> carry oxygenated blood. <coughs> Most of the time they do carry oxygenated blood, but they don't always carry oxygenated blood because we've got to get deoxygenated blood away from the heart to the lungs. So these arteries here, this pulmonary trunk and our left and right pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood. People want to think that veins always carry deoxygenated blood. Not true. Our pulmonary veins that are bringing our oxygenated blood back to the, the systemic circuit carry oxygenated blood. So that's an easy thing to trip people up on with questions sometimes because they want to just categorize them as carrying one or the other, but they're not. So the best definition is that arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood to the heart. As far as our heart goes, it's got what we say are two pumps. And that's because the right side of the heart is pumping deoxygenated blood always. The left side of the heart is pumping oxygenated <coughs> blood always. This is one place in particular where we have sidedness. So on the test, when you're identifying anything, you'll have to tell me if it's left or right. Same thing for blood vessels. They're different, left and right. So you're going to have to identify whether you're looking at the left or the right blood vessel, and that can kind of be confusing because of anatomical position. So when you're looking at it this way, I know this is the left side of the board, but this is the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart pumps deoxygenated blood. So this is what we mean when it has two pumps. They're working simultaneously, but they're pumping different types of blood. talk about the way that these are going. So our right side of the heart is pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs. We'll have gas exchange so we can pick up oxygenated blood and bring it back to the left side of the heart. And the left side of the heart is taking that oxygenated blood out to the tissues of the body. You can also say that the heart has great vessels. All of the vessels that are entering and exiting the heart we call our great vessels. And that's because they are, the arteries are these big elastic arteries that are able to resist the ventric ventricular contraction. They've got a lot of extra elastic tissue so that when the ventricles contract, they can expand, but then when the ventricles relax, they can recoil. And what that does, it allows you to maintain blood pressure even when the heart's relaxed. 
So our great arteries that are leaving the heart are the pulmonary trunk, which is bringing our blood to our right and left pulmonary arteries. And the aorta, which is taking blood, the ascending aorta here, and the, the aorta is going to take blood to all of the branches that serve the tissues of the body. So those are our arteries. So we'll say these are both our great arteries. Deoxygenated blood is returning to the heart through great vessels, our great veins. Um, we've got a couple, the, the superior vena cava. And the inferior vena cava is this guy right here. Oxygenated blood is going to return to the heart through our pulmonary veins. We've got four. So all of these guys listed on the right are our great veins. And if we look at the model, we can see our pulmonary trunk right here is the great artery that's taking blood away to the pulmonary circuit. Our aorta is the great artery that's taking away blood to our systemic circuit. Our superior vena cava is returning blood from the head and neck, maybe upper shoulders. Our inferior vena cava is returning the blood from the rest of the body. And then our right and left pulmonary veins are bringing oxygenated blood back to the systemic circuit or the left atrium. So those are our great vessels. And then the last thing that we have to talk about in the heart are the heart valves. And valves prevent the backflow of blood from one place to the other. So if the blood, when our ventricles contracted, if it went back up into our atrium, then it would be an inefficient pumping of blood. So our valves prevent the backflow of blood. our heart chambers now so that we can talk about the different valves between our different heart chambers and the different vessels. So these upper two chambers are receiving chambers and we call them the atria. So these are our atria and these are the receiving chambers. These big guys down here are our pumping chambers and they're called the ventricles. In between our atria and our ventricles, we have these valves that prevent the backflow of blood to the atria when the ventricles are contracting. They're called AV valves or atrioventricular valves. So our atrioventricular valves prevent the backflow of blood to the atria while the ventricles are contracting. have to be able to recognize about the internal anatomy of the heart. These AV valves are docked to these muscles in the ventricles called papillary muscles by these things called chordae tendinae, or your heart strings. And they're really cool, they're very strong. They're these connective tissue uh, attachments that hold the AV valves to these papillary muscles so that when you get the strong forceful contraction, it doesn't blow the valves open and back into the atria. 
So these, when, when the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles contract, and pull on those so that the AV valves stay shut. We'll look at that again in a minute. But we should know the names of our two AV valves. On the right side, we have the tricuspid valve. So this is between the right atrium and ventricle. And on the left side, we have the bicuspid valve, also called the mitral valve because it kind of looks like the mitral hat that bishops or popes or somebody in the Catholic Church wears. So on this other side, we have the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. And this is between our left atrium and ventricle. So those are going to be the valves that prevent the backflow of blood to the atrium from the ventricles. We have a second set of valves called our semilunar valves. I'm going to write them up here. And our semilunar valves prevent the backflow of blood to the ventricles from the arteries when the ventricles relax. showing them, so I'll show you on the model where they are. We've got two, the pulmonary semilunar valve. Ooh, maybe this model is not a great model for it. Yeah, here's one. Oh, yeah, we can see them both. So the pulmonary semilunar valve is the valve that prevents backflow of blood when the ventricles relax from the pulmonary trunk to the right ventricle. And then the aortic semilunar valve is kind of harder to see because the aorta is kind of posterior to it. But you can see it back here. And it's going to prevent the backflow of blood to the left ventricle when it relaxes. So these valves are working under different kinds of pressures. So the AV valves, they're just kind of, when the heart relaxes, they open up and blood passively flows from the atria to the ventricles. Then the atria contract and squeeze the rest of the blood into the ventricles. So they're kind of under contractile forces, the AV valves are. The semilunar valves are under different pressure forces. So when there's incredible pressure in the ventricles because they're contracting, it blows the semilunar valves open and blood flows through. And then when the ventricles relax, the blood kind of comes back and snaps them shut. So because there's decreased pressure in the ventricles, then the blood comes back and snaps them shut so it doesn't flow back into the ventricles. So the names of our two semilunar valves are the pulmonary semilunar valve and the aortic semilunar valve. So our pulmonary semilunar valve prevents backflow to the right ventricle. And our aortic semilunar valve prevents backflow to the left ventricle. It's, it's when we're talking about blood flow through the heart, by convention we start in the right atrium and then move through the pulmonary circuit and come back to the left atrium. So one thing that can help you remember which is which is that you should try before you buy. <coughs> so these two pumps then give us what we call our pulmonary circuit and our systemic circuit. Our pulmonary circuit on the right side of the heart and going to the lung. And our systemic circuit is taking the blood from the left side of the heart to the tissues. So if we think about blood flow through the heart, by convention we start here at our right atrium. And from what's dumping into our right atrium is our superior vena cava, our inferior vena cava is coming up into it as well, and a spot called the coronary sinus. 
So the heart has its own blood supply. So it's a very busy tissue, so it has to get blood supply as well. And all of the veins that drain the heart dump into this place in the back of the heart, this thickened region back here called the coronary sinus. So all of the deoxygenated blood that is entering the heart is coming from the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. When we dissect hearts today, you can actually reach your fingers through the inferior and superior vena cava and touch each your fingers. It's pretty cool. And then the coronary sinus is also bringing blood. So the pulmonary circuit begins at the right atrium, which is receiving blood. So we'll say blood from the SVC, which is superior vena cava, the IVC, inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus. enters the right atrium. It goes through the tricuspid to the right ventricle. It goes through the pulmonary, the pulmonary semilunar valve. pulmonary trunk. It goes from the pulmonary trunk, so this is what this, our pulmonary trunk branches into left and right pulmonary arteries. We can see that here, so our pulmonary trunk comes up and branches into left and right pulmonary arteries. We'll see that arteries branch and branch and branch and, until we get to capillaries, but we'll come from our pulmonary trunk to our left and right pulmonary arteries. They're going to go to the lungs. They're going to branch and branch and branch. We're going to get to a capillary bed where we'll have gas exchange. So oxygen is going to come into the blood. CO2 is going to exit the blood. Now that blood will enter our pulmonary veins. that bring it back to the left atrium, which begins our systemic circuit. So from the pulmonary veins, we come to the left atrium. We go through the bicuspid valve to the left ventricle, through the aortic semilunar valve to the ascending aorta. So this part right here we call the ascending aorta. This is the aortic arch. Then we're going to go to all the branches of the aorta. We've got a descending aorta, branches that come off of it. We're going to go out to this. There, all of our arteries are going to branch and branch and branch until we get capillary beds. So we go through the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta, to the branches of the aorta, to capillary beds. We're going to have nutrients and gas exchange occur. So O2 is going to leave the blood. CO2 is going to enter the blood. Now this will be picked up in little venules that converge on veins that are going to dump back into our inferior and superior vena cava. So we'll say this blood goes into veins that dump ultimately back into our inferior and superior vena cava. So the pulmonary circuit is all of that from our right atrium through our right ventricle out to our lungs and then our systemic circuit is from our pulmonary veins and our left atrium and our left ventricle out to the tissues of the body. So we have these two different circuits that are conducting our blood either to the lungs or to the tissues. All right, as far as the location of our heart, the location is that the heart is found deep within the mediastinum. So if we look at our thoracic cavity, our thoracic cavity, all of the organs are surrounded by their own serous membranes, and that's because they're vital organs. So if one lung gets an infection, it's harder for it to spread through the mediastinum and pericardium to the heart and then through the other pleural membrane to the other lung because each organ has its own serous membrane, which is different than the serous membranes in the abdominal pelvic cavity. They're all the same. So 
are the location of the heart is that it's found here, kind of intermediate to your lungs, and um, within this membranous partition called the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is a membranous partition that surrounds the great vessels and the pericardium. So it's found within the mediastinum. And the mediastinum is a membranous partition that surrounds our great vessels and the pericardium. Pericardium is the serous membrane of the heart, and it's unique among serous membranes because it's got three layers. Other things that we could say about the location of the heart is that it is it's sitting on the di diaphragm. The apex of the heart is the point of the heart down here, and it sits on the diaphragm. And it's mostly centered, except for that it's kind of jutting off to the left a little bit. So your left lung is actually different from your right lung because it's got a cardiac notch to accommodate that. So as far as the anatomy of the heart goes, we call this top part the base of the heart. And in the body, it kind of points back toward your right shoulder. And this pointy part is the apex of the heart that sits down on your diaphragm. And you can actually feel between your fifth and sixth ribs, you can feel the apical impulse if you are feeling closely enough. Um, and so the apex sits down on your diaphragm. And that's where it's located in the thoracic cavity. The pericardium is a unique serous membrane because it's got three layers. All of the rest of our serous membranes only have two layers. But the heart is always continuously beating. So the two layers of the serous membrane that are like other serous membranes help it do that. But it also needs to be kind of held still and in place in the thorax. So how can we hold this continually beating organ still and in place in the thorax? Um, and we do that with the outer layer of the pericardium, which is the fibrous layer. So if we look at the heart, this is the base of the heart. This is the apex. At the base of the heart, we have all of our great vessels leaving or entering, and the mediastinum is surrounding that all. Well, the pericardium is kind of unique. It's got these three layers. It's got a fibrous outer layer. That's kind of too big for it, but... So its most superficial layer is the fibrous layer, and this has dense connective tissue. And what the fibrous layer is doing is it's anchoring the heart to surrounding structures. nice and strong and fibrous, it actually prevents the heart from overfilling. Deep to the fibrous layer, we have our parietal layer. Our second layer is the parietal pericardium. And at the base of the heart, the parietal layer folds back on itself to become the visceral layer that hugs the heart tightly. So the black layer is the visceral layer. And it's also simple squamous epithelial tissue. <coughs> Both the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium are secreting serous fluid that we call pericardial fluid into this space called the pericardial cavity. So we could call this the pericardial <coughs> cavity. <coughs> And 
and our visceral layer and our parietal layer both secrete serous fluid. into that space, so into our pericardial cavity. And so that's what's going to allow the heart to beat and beat and beat continuously without rubbing up against the walls of your thorax and causing problems. There's a condition called pericarditis where you get inflammation of your uh, visceral and parietal pericardial layers. They don't produce enough um, pericardial fluid then, and these people can feel every heartbeat. One of the students in my class at Red Rocks today told me she's had peri she has pericarditis. She got it um, on two different occasions, and it becomes really painful. It just hurts. You feel your heartbeat, and it's really painful. When she lays down, it gets worse, and if she lays on her left side, it's like the worst that it can be. And so that's just this normal functioning of this allows us not to feel our heart beating in our chest. It allows us to kind of float freely there, these visceral and parietal layers allow it to fr flow freely there, and then the fibrous layer is going to keep it in place inside the thorax. The heart wall has three layers. The epicardium, which is that visceral layer of the pericardium. So all around the outside here would be the epicardium. So the outermost layer is the epicardium. And we'll say this is the heart wall. It's got three layers. The epicardium, which is the visceral pericardium. Then our middle layer is this thick muscular layer called the myocardium. So it's primarily composed of cells called myocardiocytes. are the contractile cells of the heart. It's also got some connective tissue flowing uh, throughout it that gives it, the, it's like the cardiac skeleton they call it, and it's going to, that connective tissue is going to help kind of hold it together as it's continuously beating. It also insulates the heart so that we're conducting action potentials just along <coughs> our heart's conduction system. So it helps to make sure that we're conducting the electrical impulses in all of the places that they need to go. So that's the connective tissue found in it. So we can say there's also connective tissue skeleton that helps to give some um, structural integrity. So it helps with structure. And it insulates the heart so that our conduction system is working in just one way. And we'll talk about the conduction system starting on Monday. So we'll say, and it insulates uh, for efficient conducting. So we'll talk about the conduction system on Monday. Then the innermost layer of the heart, the lining of the heart walls, is a simple squamous epithelial layer called the endocardium. So endo always means within. So the endocardium lines the, heart, lines the walls of the heart chamber, or different chambers. This is our innermost layer, and it's simple squamous epithelial tissue that is going to be continuous with the endothelium of our blood vessels. And our blood vessels are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until all they are is endothelium at the level of the capillaries, and that's where we're going to have nutrient and gas exchange across the thinnest possible barrier. So it lines our chambers, it's simple squamous epithelial tissue, We'll say it is continuous with endothelium of blood vessels. Our outermost layer is the epicardium. It's simple squamous epithelial tissue. It's, it is the visceral pericardium. 
Our middle layer is the myocardium. This is the thickest layer. And this picture kind of shows it. You'll be able to see it in your sheep hearts better. Um, maybe we can see it on this model. That the myocardium in the left ventricle, in the left side of the heart, is a lot thicker than the myocardium in the right side of the heart. You can kind of see it here, not really well. You'll see it in your hearts that we dissect. Can you imagine why that would be? Why would it be thicker on the left side? Because you have to descend further. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Katie. What? Katie? But I was just saying because it has to go to the body, so it has to be stronger on that side. Right. So on the left side, it's pumping to the whole body. So it's got to be really thick and muscular. On the right side, it's just pumping to the lungs. So it doesn't need to be quite so thick and muscular. I hope we have a disease sheep heart because sometimes we'll get a diseased one and you can tell there was some kind of blockage in the artery because it will be so, so thick on one side. So much thicker than every other heart that you see. And then what you can tell from that is that there's some kind of blockage out in the system that's making it pump that much harder. So if you get like hardening of the arteries in your aorta and your ventricle has to pump a lot harder, then the myocardium will be thicker. So it's pretty interesting. So hopefully we have a disease sheep we can see that. So again, the myocardium is primarily composed of these myocardiocytes. There's some connective tissue in there as well. But this is the, this is the layer of the heart that contracts. And so it, it's really pumping all that blood. And it's a lot thicker on our left side than it is on the right side. The atria aren't very muscular because they're not really, their job's not really to pump. They're receiving blood. They do pump a little bit. They just eject all of the rest of the blood into the ventricles. The ventricles have the big job of pumping. So the myocardium's thicker in the ventricles and it's a lot thicker in the left ventricle because it's pumping out to the whole circuit. So as far as structures that you have to be able to recognize, we've already talked about our heart chambers. The atria are our receiving chambers. The ventricles are pumping chambers. If we look at our atria, they have these little kind of ridgy extensions right here. These are called auricles. And the auricles allow for a little more space so that when like you're exercising and you have increased venous return, they can accept more blood. So um, for structures that you have to recognize, we could say these are our auricles and they give a little extra space to the atria. Inside the auricles, or inside our atria, the auricles have these ridges of muscle called pectinate muscles. So on the inside, they've got pectinate muscles. portions of the ventricular walls are called trabeculae carnae. So I'll write that over here. So the ventricles also contain, let's say they're lined with these muscles called trabeculae <coughs> carnae. So other things that you have to be able to recognize, there are these um, like dips between our ventricles. 
These are called the interventricular sulci. And then all between the atria and the ventricles going all the way around is the coronary sulcus. So this kind of dip here that you see is called the coronary sulcus. So running around between the atria and the ventricles is the coronary sulcus. In the front, we can see this inter anterior interventricular sulcus. And this is going to be important because we've got arteries and veins running in them. So there are these dips that are filled with fat and then also house the arteries and veins that are serving the heart. So we're going to talk about the coronary, the coronary circulation in just a second. But this one in the front is called the anterior interventricular sulcus. And there's one in the back also. interventricular because it's between the ventricles. On the posterior view, back here we have the posterior interventricular sulcus. sulcus running around the back between our atria and our ventricles. And these contain the vessels that are going to give us our coronary circulation. So our coronary circulation are the blood vessels that serve the heart tissue. So coming off of the aorta, we have branches that are going to give rise to all of these different arteries we're talking about. So here's the right coronary artery. So now we're talking about our coronary blood supply or our coronary circulation. And this serves the heart. So off of our aorta, we have our left and right our coronary arteries are going to branch. So our right coronary artery is going to come around and give rise to this, what's called the right marginal artery. So, the right coronary artery branches into the right marginal artery. If we follow it around, so here in the front you can see the right coronary artery. This numbered one coming down the side is the right marginal artery. It's going to come around and branch again down into the posterior interventricular artery. So those are the branches of the right coronary artery. People have different vessels, they, their hearts and the, 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 the arteries serving the heart and the veins draining the heart can be different from person to person. These ones are the same in everyone. So that's why these are the ones that we talk about and the only ones that we'll test you on. But you can see other branches on the front of this heart. We're not naming those because everybody's got different ones. And they, they, when we talk about blood vessels, we'll talk about what are called anastomoses, which are different ways that blood vessels converge together. And you can have different anastomoses all over your heart. So the ones that you have to name are the ones that everybody has. And those are the branches of the right coronary artery that you have to know. The right marginal artery here in the front and the posterior interventricular artery. If we come around on the left side, then our left coronary artery, you can't really see a whole lot of it. I guess, I guess it's this 29 here, this little part here that's coming out. But then this is coming down and branching into our anterior interventricular artery, and then it comes around and branches into what's called the circumflex artery. So the left coronary artery branches into the anterior interventricular artery and the circumflex artery. So on this picture, the left coronary artery 
is coming out of here and branching down into our anterior intraventricular artery, but then it also branches around into the circumflex artery that's running in the coronary sulcus. Our right coronary artery is going to come down, and there's not really a good picture. Uh, our right or coronary artery comes down and branches into the right marginal artery, and then on the posterior side, is going to branch into our posterior interventricular artery. So this is the right coronary artery coming around here, and it branches into the posterior interventricular artery. So oxygenated blood will enter the arteries and serve the, the tissues of the heart wall, and then we'll have capillary exchange, and then it'll all get picked back up into veins. Again, the veins can be very different from person to person, so you only need to know three veins. So the veins that you need to know are the great cardiac vein that runs with the anterior interventricular artery. So our great cardiac vein runs with the anterior interventricular artery in that anterior interventricular ventricular sulcus. The vein that runs with the right marginal artery is called the small cardiac vein. So this vein here in the front is the great cardiac vein. This vein here on the side that's going with our right marginal artery is the small cardiac vein. And then our middle cardiac vein is the vein that's running with the posterior interventricular artery in that posterior interventricular sulcus. So that's our middle cardiac vein. So you can see back here on the back, running with the posterior interventricular artery is our middle cardiac vein. All of our veins are going to dump into the coronary sinus. So this is the coronary sinus, and we'll say that it drains all the veins from the heart. And it's going to drain it right into the left or the, the right atrium. And our inferior vena cava and superior vena cava are going to bring the blood back from the rest of the body.